This is 2015 AP Chemistry Free Response number six and number seven. Question six has one part of it that's fair game and one part that is not. The first part asks whether or not you should support a student hypothesis. The student hypothesis is as follows. The student says that salts that are composed of a small cation and a large anion will have low melting points. So you're kind of looking for that and uh, state how the data supports the student's hypothesis. So in doing this, you really have to find something with a small cation and a large anion and see if they have a low melting point. Um, and to, in terms of looking for this, you should be able to refer to, I always say, refer to electron configurations or at least numbers of energy levels. So a lithium ion basically has only uh, two electrons, so it has one shell. So that's a small, and it's a cation, right, because it's an Li plus, right? So I can look at those ones and say, okay, that has a small cation, and it has a large anion, okay? So uh, because I minus, and I minus is going to have a lar lot of shells. It's going to have like four or five shells, okay? And again, you could write out the electron configuration. And that's an example where you have a small cation and a large anion. The other three choices are a little iffy, um, it, but you want to at least have a cation that's smaller than the anion. So there's two other choices there that kind of fit the bill, and there's one that does not, okay? And again, and obviously the first one does in fact have a low melting point. You have to find another one that also has a low melting point and has a small a cation that's smaller than the anion. Again, I would refer to the electron configurations, even if you have to write them out. So for like, if like you choose lithium, you could just write, oh, lithium ion, it would have been 1s2, 2s1, but because it's an ion, it's only 1s2, and that means it has one shell, right? And you could, I wouldn't write out iodine, it's too long, but you might refer to the periodic table and recognize how many shells it does in fact have. The second part says, which would give a basic solution while in dissolved in water? Again, I'm gonna to refer to this for, if I wanna use this in the future, but this would not be on this year's exam. You should recognize that a salt, okay, that contains the conjugate of a weak acid will be basic. And you basically have two possible anions here. Either the I minus will react with water, okay, and grab a hydrogen and reform the acid and make hydroxides, or the F minus one. Um, the one that does this will be the conjugate of the weak acid, all right, because the, strong, the conjugate of a strong acid is essentially neutral in solution. All right, this next question, number seven, is a, another calorimetry question. There seems to be one of these on almost every single AP exam. I can't see them not finding something in here with the measurement of heat or the measurement of a delta H in this exam or the utilization of both. So the first question has to do with, um, it's basically saying to you, there's two ways to get aluminum. You can recycle the aluminum or you can take aluminum oxide and you can use electrolysis, which is what's done in industry. Um, and they're saying which one is more energy efficient, recycling the aluminum or extracting it from its ore. All right, so let's talk about the first one. So the first is calculate the amount of heat needed to purify a mole of aluminum that's originally 298K by melting it. Okay, and then it says the melting point is 933 Kelvin. So what you wanna recognize with this question is you're gonna to have to use two formulas because the first thing you gotta do is you gotta get it from 298 up to 933. And then you're going to have to melt it. So you're going to have to choose two separate formulas here. The, the MC delta T formula is going to be used here, and the MHF is going to be used here. Now, they're giving you these as molar heat capacity, okay? And the heat diffusion is also given per mole. Be very careful about the units. You'll get this. This is a critical error students make consistently on the AP exam, okay? The specific heat for the aluminum is given in joules per mole Kelvin. So you're going to get an answer in joules when you do this part. But in the second part, you're going to get an answer in kilojoules. So you need to convert that from joules to kilojoules. Remember, 1,000 joules is equal to one kilojoule. So watch how you move that decimal. All right, the second part of the question, when you do the comparison, so you, and you're going to figure out these two values of Q, and we'll call this Q1 and this Q2, and you're going to add them up together once you have them both in kilojoules and get a total amount of kilojoules to basically raise the temperature and melt one mole of aluminum. Uh, the, and by the way, you can definitely use delta T in Kelvin. It's just the difference in temperature. Uh, the equation for the overall processing of extracting aluminum as shown below is given. They give you a delta H and note this is giving you in kilojoules per mole and note it is a positive value indicating the process is endothermic, meaning you have to absorb energy from the surroundings 
for this to occur. By the way, this is normally done in the form of electricity, not in the form of heat, but that's immaterial here. So if you want to get the answer for how much to get one mole of aluminum, be very careful because this is the amount of energy for two moles of aluminum. If you want to do comparison, okay, if you're doing this for one mole, you have to do this for one mole. So be very careful when you're doing your final comparisons and determining your actual values for extracting a mole of aluminum and then doing the comparison.